right. Welcome back, everyone. We are Plant-Based Kidney Health. As always, I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi. My partner is Michelle Krosmer, who is a registered dietitian. We are so delighted. I can't believe, Michelle, we're at episode six. So number six already. We're moving through these quickly. Wow. And, you know, I tell you, every single episode we do, it seems like it's hard to keep up with the questions. We're getting more and more questions. So thank you guys for putting your questions in. And we promise if we haven't gotten to them, we have a list. We're keeping track. And our email is plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com, plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com. Or you can go ahead and put it in you know, the messages below. And as always, we always ask if you would be so kind to just share this podcast and this the YouTube videos with your friends. And that's how... It helps us to get the message out. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. So, guys. Michelle, I, I wanted to start off by telling you, you know, I now that 2022 is here, my my daughters, my older one is nine. Her name is Faith and my younger one is Celine. So it's like Faith Hill and Celine Dion. Love Neither it. of my daughters can sing. <laughs> they can't. They have daddy's voice, not this bad voice, but they really can't sing. So I didn't get that gene. But um they have really, really started to get into jujitsu, and I'm so excited for them because uh, what I wanted to do was to find a sport for them that would really encourage them to gain that self confidence, to learn discipline. Because I feel that, you know, we do this podcast and we talk to so many patients, and what we find is people have a hard time making commitments, whether it's to their own health, to their diet. And with my kids, what I'm hoping to do is. If they learn the act of discipline in one area, I think that will translate over into other aspects of their life. So it's it's amazing. It's these kids. I mean, the stuff they do and, you know, my older one and my younger one, I think both of them can beat me up. So that's an interesting phenomenon. Now, when I walk, I don't walk in front of them to protect them. I walk <laughs> behind them. I have two bodyguards. It doesn't matter that one is like, you know, four feet and the other is like less than four feet. But yeah. you know what? I am well defended and protected now. That's awesome. I love that that, you know, that's the sport they're in. And I'm, I'm jealous that they, that they're doing that. They know how to do jujitsu. So it, it's been really fun. And I tell you, I mean, to all of the parents who are watching us and listening to us, you know, seeing your kids learn something and blossom and, you know, the chance to just share those moments, it's, it's been such an honor and a privilege. And every chance I get from work now, when I'm working, I try to run home so I can just get to the class and, you know, catch half an hour or 45 minutes of the class because it's, it's amazing to see somebody at that age and have all the potential and to be able to do stuff it's fascinating and our message and i I know michelle you'd agree with me on this has always been is how do we help people to become a little bit better today than they were yesterday and that's what jujitsu also teaches is it's not fast you can't just get a black belt it's a very slow journey and that's like the journey of life Mm -hmm. so we're all going to work on eating more plants and then we're going to all start doing jujitsu. <laughs> what a combo. I what a combo. It'll be plant-based kidney health jujitsu. Yep. <laughs> yes. Well, good. Well, I think all right. today mm-hmm. so we I mean again, we're episode 6 and we're into part 2 of our talk on diabetes and kidney disease and kidney health. And if you guys haven't listened to episode 5 yet, please check that out <clears throat> because we really dive into you know, in that episode, we talked about why high blood sugar damages the kidneys, why there's this a lot of myths around a diabetes diet and a kidney diet, and then what are some tips that you guys can do. But today we want to, you know, dive even more into questions that we often get around diabetes, blood sugar, and kidney disease, or even just diabetes in general. But before we do that, I think Again, we're always talking about, oh, you know, kidney health awareness and being proactive. So if someone has, let's say someone has diabetes, they have prediabetes, um, what lab work, blood work, urine work, like what should they be having um, done to see if they even have damage to their kidneys in the first place? And then how frequently should they be getting that work done? Yeah, so the earliest test that you can do is actually just a simple urine test. Because if we see that you have sugar in the urine, and if we see that you have protein in the urine, whether it's a little bit or a lot, but, you know, people sometimes, and and this doesn't occur to all the people, so it's important for you guys who are listening, if you have bubbles in the urine, 
or the urine is very foamy, that can be a sign of having protein spilling in the urine. That doesn't mean that's always a sign. So just because you have it, don't freak out. Check with your doctor. They can do a simple urine test. On the blood test part, we check what's called a metabolic panel or a metabolic comprehensive panel. And that checks your electrolytes and it checks things like your creatinine. Creatinine, remember, it's an indirect marker for kidney function. So when we check that, a lot of people in the beginning, their kidney function test, which is the creatinine, remember, it's indirect, is normal. But in one of the earlier episodes, if you remember, we talked about this idea that when you get diabetes, your kidneys start off at a normal size, they actually start to increase and they get larger and larger. But your kidney function, the blood test, does not change. We can pick it up through a urine test to see if there's protein in the urine going on. Of course, if we took an ultrasound of it. But the important part of that is first the kidney gets larger and then the kidney starts to shrink. And when it starts to shrink, that's nephrons or kidney cells that are dying. So it's really, really important to always keep an eye out on it. And the biggest risk factors for being a diabetic is if you have extra weight. If you have extra weight, it's a good idea to check with your doctor to see, are you a pre-diabetic? Are you a diabetic? What are your sugars running? And we can do that very, very easily. So I think from a basic perspective, urine test first, blood test second. And is this something that should be done annually for someone um, or more frequently? Like let's say someone does have protein leaking in their urine and they have diabetes, should it be checked more, more often than once a year? So if you already have that diagnosis, then absolutely you need to have it checked more frequently. In fact, what we do is is we like to see patients on a regular basis. Now, your doctor will determine what that frequency is based on your individual circumstances. A lot of my patients, when we make changes, for example, we change their medications and so forth. If a medication affects their electrolytes, like they may raise their potassium, for example, like an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, so lisinopril, benazepril, all those pills. If it's one of those medications, I'll check a potassium within one to two weeks to make sure that that dose is safe for them. But in terms of bringing them back, it's usually in about three months, sometimes it's four to six months going on, depending on where they're at, because it takes a few months to see changes. Remember, even on an A1C, A1C measures sugar stuck to the blood, A red blood cell lasts about 120 days. So if you see them in a month, even though they may be getting better, their A1C may not actually go down because it's measuring indirectly the sugar that's stuck to the red blood cells. And for the urinalysis then, you know, and I always think of how labs come back. So if someone does just a normal, like they pee in a cup at the doctor, and that's where they would see where it showed like protein, you know, one plus two plus so that's a sign that protein is in the urine but then what is different from that and the micro albumin testing that is being done yeah excellent question so once we know that you know because a lot of people you don't have to check it but in general so as nephrologist we don't actually just check a routine urinalysis we check specifically a urine microalbumin to creatinine ratio. And the reason we check a urine microalbumin to creatinine ratio is because there are standards identified. You want that number to be less than 30, to be in the normal range. If it's higher than 30, that means you are spilling microalbumin in the urine. Now, why the microalbumin to creatinine is because of the fact that in order to get rid of this issue of concentration, all blood tests are concentration. So in other words, if I drank more water and I made my urine dilute, would that affect my protein in the urine? Well, by making it a concentration issue, by dividing it by creatinine, I get rid of that issue. But ultimately, check a urine microalbumin to creatinine ratio. Your doctor will do that. You don't have to remember it. But if you have foamy urine, just remember it's important to work it out. If you're overweight, have extra weight, and you're worried about it, always at least once a year visit your doctor. Make sure, hey, am I at risk of being a pre-diabetic? You know, sometimes just having somebody nudge us and remind us of our health makes such an impact to move in the right direction. Yeah. And that's, I know we mentioned it on the last episode, but that range for prediabetes, if you are looking at the A1C lab work is, you know, 5.7 up to about 6.4 or 6.5 and then 6.5 and higher is diabetes. And so that's something I, I feel like sometimes 
people aren't getting a co- maybe they don't get a copy of their blood work or they're just told, oh, you're good. Or I hear a lot of times I'm borderline diabetic. And so if you're borderline diabetic, you want to know that number because it's likely pre-diabetes. And like you mentioned before, that still has an impact on our kidneys and can be damaging to the kidneys, even if it's pre-diabetes. So we want to make sure that we're being, whether it's pre-diabetes or diabetes, that we are making changes and controlling blood sugar better. And, and remember, we define pre-diabetes and diabetes. Your kidneys don't know that definition. What they know is there's extra pressure on them. So if you get somebody who's like 6.499999 and says, well, doc, you know, I'm just a pre-diabetic. Well, your kidneys don't care you're a pre-diabetic. That may be enough pressure for you to have full-blown diabetic kidney disease. So as always, strive to be a little bit better than where you were yesterday. Yep, love that. All right, let me ask you a question, Mm -hmm. Michelle. So we got this question and, you know, in the future, what we're going to do is we're actually going to have people's names so that if you ask a question, we want to make sure that we acknowledge you and we, we definitely do that. But this was a question asked and it was really, what are the best artificial sweeteners for someone to consume? Now, this is somebody who has, let's say, kidney disease or heart disease, whatever, or diabetes. And, you know, is there ones that are better than others or not? Um, I get asked this all the time. And so um, I think the, a, a really good way to look at it is we want to look at these artificial sweeteners or non-nutritive um, sweeteners as, okay, are they potentially harmful? Are they potentially harmless? Um, I think regardless across the board, they are not beneficial to our diet. Like we know there's not these added health benefits of consuming them, but then we want to know, okay, are they help? Are they harmful? Or are they harmless? And so the the most the ones who that have been around the longest if you think of like aspartame sucralose um acylfame potassium i'm probably saying that one wrong saccharin um those are all artificial sweeteners that for multiple different reasons but those are potentially harmful and those are things when we think of the little sugar packets you know the blues and yellows and the um, pink packets artificial sweetener packets that's what we're talking about there or if you are looking at the ingredient list of usually you'll find it in products that are putting a claim that they're low in sugar low carbohydrate they're you instead of using sugar um, or a corn syrup or something like that they are using these artificial sweeteners instead so aside of from those, I would say it's best to avoid those and avoid products that contain those. And then what we get into is the natural um, non-nutritive sweeteners, which are things like stevia and monk fruit. And I think the hard thing with those is that they, so it's always about what you compare it to. So stevia or monk fruit, consuming those compared to the artificial sweeteners like aspartame, sucralose is definitely going to be better. And likely going to likely going to be harmless if you're not consuming in in very large quantities um you know they're extracted from you know plants and they you know and that's how they're making this non-nutritive sweetener but again it's thinking about what is what food are these added to they're typically added to highly processed food that they want to taste very sweet that way you like the taste of it but you're not having these blood sugar spikes after your meal because it's not actual sugar and um and i'll come back to that part but then the other category is sugar alcohols and um, oftentimes common ones are like erythritol or xylitol and the concern with not necessarily with erythritol, they don't see this, but with xylitol and other sugar alcohols is um, they can have this like laxative or diarrhea effect. So it can draw water into the colon and then cause, you know, gas, um, gassiness, bloating, diarrhea and that sort of thing, which potentially could be harmful. So I think from the standpoint of, yes, stevia and monk fruit or erythritol over these other artificial sweeteners is going to be better. Um, I don't recommend, again, there's no benefit to you consuming it. If you have, you know, a fruit as a dessert over a processed sweet that has stevia in it, you know, it's a no brainer, which one's going to be better, but there's still room, you know, for that flexibility in the diet. But the thing that's important to remember is these non-nutritive sweeteners are, they're hundreds of times sweeter than actual sugar. And so they can usually use them in smaller quantities. But what happens is we still, our taste buds and, you know, become heightened for this like extra sweet flavor and we crave it and we want it. And they've even done studies while they've compared aspartame and sucralose and stevia and monk fruit 
and actual table sugar. And they've found that, yes, after consuming the table sugar, you get the spike in blood sugar right after it, that the average blood sugar was similar amongst all the different sugar, artificial sweetener, and non-nutritive sweeteners. And potentially the reason for that is, is that a lot of times, and we associate this with like diet drinks, is that it leaves people feeling hungrier. They end up eating more later on in the day. And then that might contribute to just the same average blood sugar over the course of the day. So um, in summary, what I would say, again, stevia or monk fruit or erythritol are going to be better than some of these other options um, that are more harmful, but it's still not something where it's just this, oh, here's a, a, a green pass, have as much as you want, because it's often in highly processed food that these are used. And again, they can change our taste buds and make us crave and want sweeter things or more, you know, carbohydrate rich foods or potentially overeat later on in the day when we're consuming those. Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent answer. And, you know, the only thing from a medical perspective, I would just add is, is in the very elegant animal model studies that were done, what it showed was number one, that when you compare two mice models and you gave them exactly the same amount of food and you gave them one was a sugar drink, the other was an artificial sweetener. And the only thing on those studies was they did, they looked at all sorts of sweeteners. So they didn't, uh, said one was worse or better than the other. And that may have to do with, you know, how they were getting funding and so forth. But what they found out was that if you had artificial sweetness, those mice would consume way more calories. Number two is when you're dealing with artificial sweeteners and you have something that's 200 to 26,000 times sweeter, you're never going to find a strawberry that tastes that sweet, right? So this, this, thing is, is that it makes all these beautiful, delicious foods not taste the same. And what we're trying to convince people when we talk about plant focused or moving towards a plant based diet is, is fruit is sweet enough. And there's so much beauty in eating fruit that if you just allow yourself to go that route, you'll have wonders. Oftentimes, you know, people, they are, they, they say, you know, I, I want to stop smoking. Therefore, let me pick something else to smoke. But the, the goal here is we want you to cut smoking out, stop putting chemicals directly into your lungs, right? You may be taking a step downwards, which is great and we applaud you. But don't forget that sometimes the step downwards is how a lot of people start. They start on those other things and that's how they progress to the final product. So they may start with things like artificial sweeteners and they go into all this stuff and they think they're doing themselves good. They think the diet Coke is okay because it says the word diet on it. And therefore I can have this meal and I feel good about it and not guilty because I did a diet with it. And and that's clever marketing. But, you know, I, I do think that as we think about this stuff, our message has always been from episode one till now is, is we are trying to get you to look at nature, right? Instead of thinking about juicing something, we're trying to get you to look at, look at the whole food. And if you think about it in those terms, you'll do great. That doesn't mean you can't have anything. We're not about can't or should not or anything. We're about you can and how can we encourage you? Definitely. And I think the other thing around that one, like as far as a dessert, and I, it's funny, I put a poll on my Instagram the other day about this because I had posted about non candy, like holiday treats. And it was all different, you know, fruit type of desserts. And I had put a pull up on my Instagram story asking people like, do you think fruit is a good dessert? And, you know, yes, it's great. Or like doesn't count. And majority of people, you know, 80, 85% said that they enjoyed fruit as a sweet tree. And so I was really happy to see that. And sometimes it's just mixing it up. Like you feel like, oh, well, I didn't you know, I eat an apple for a snack. It doesn't feel like dessert, but there's things where you can, you know, sprinkle some cinnamon or even the pumpkin spice seasoning over an apple or a pear or, um, you know, sliced strawberries or things like that, that can a fruit salad or something where it can taste really good, especially if you're buying fruit that's in season and it's more flavorful and sweeter. It can really take that place of a, a very, you know, sweetened or artificially sweetened dessert. It's making me hungry already. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, so I have the next question for you. And this is one, again, 
definitely outside of my scope of practice, but I, I get asked this a lot and I see it in a lot of forums online and on Facebook and stuff for kidney disease. But are there any diabetes medications that can potentially impact the kidneys in a negative way or, you know, anything that's contraindicated where if you have diabetes and then you find out you have kidney disease, then you shouldn't be taking that medication anymore. Yeah, so th this is a, a really interesting question. I think certainly there are medications that you got to be very, very careful in general if you have kidney disease. The biggest one of that, especially if you're a diabetic, is a category of pain medications called NSAIDs. And the reason this matters so much is, is without going into very, very technical details, NSAIDs, which is things like Motrin, Ibuprofen, Excedrin, Aleve, and so forth going on, what they do is they decrease the blood flow going into the kidneys. And your kidneys want that blood. So if you end up decreasing that, that becomes tricky. Now, your doctor will oftentimes give you medications such as ACE inhibitors, what we call ARBs, aldosterone antagonists going on. All of those medications, they work also in a manner where they're trying to affect a certain part of the kidney. And so they're trying to take the pressure off the kidney by not letting so much blood go there. If you combine those medicines with NSAIDs, you're actually setting yourself up for significant kidney issues. Not only that, you can actually get very high potassium levels going on and of course potentially acute kidney injury or kidney failure going on. So probably the biggest thing that we talk about is NSAIDs mm -hmm. and always talk to your doctor about it. Now, certain diabetes medications, for example, metformin, which metformin, as you know, is has been around for a really long time. It's actually one of the best medications. The new research is so fascinating because what it's showing is, is that it may actually have a pretty substantial role in longevity. And this is why a lot of people in the Silicon Valley are running to their doctors and saying, I want metformin. Well, you don't need metformin. I want it anyways. Metformin also causes weight loss. But metformin, if your kidney function you know, we talk about GFR in some of our previous episodes. If your kidney function is less than 30, there's a small chance for developing something known as lactic acidosis, which can be deadly. Now, you don't want to stop your metformin. Metformin is very effective because what it does is it makes, remember, Michelle had this great example at a previous episode about the lock and key model and how the, the lock kind of gets muddled with fat going on. Well, metformin fixes that lock. It makes it so the key works better. So the insulin that comes and acts on the cells is able to drive that sugar through those cells. So metformin is a very important drug, but at the same time, you have to know where your kidney function is. And if it's too low, you have to stop it. Other medications are ones that can actually cause weight gain. So we like to pick better ones. So glipizide is one common one. Of course, insulin causes weight gain as well. And now we have a whole new class of drugs called SGLT2 inhibitors. And these have actually been shown to be very, very effective in reducing the risk of kidneys progressing to dialysis. So when you meet with your doctor, your doctor will look at all of the medications you're on. But before you add on any supplements, before you add on any other medications, including over-the-counter medications, you definitely want to talk to your doctor about it. Even common things like proton pump inhibitors, which are used for acid reflux, they are linked rarely to kidney disease. So if you're on them for a long time, that's something that we get concerned about. And once again, we want to be able to guide you through it. It may be something you need, but can we have a drug holiday? Could we do it so that you're on for a couple months, we take a few weeks off so that we protect your kidneys in the meanwhile? So really complex question. Your individual situation may differ and you want to touch base with your doctor, but the most important one is things like NSAIDs, which is all your painkillers. They're called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Those are the ones that you really want to start with. Thank you. That that explains it really well. And that's so important for everyone to have, you know, some people take tons and tons of medications and some might just be on a little bit, but having a list of all of your meds that you're taking. And especially if you see different doctors, like different specialists and they're prescribing different things, you know, yes, you want to run all your meds by every doctor, but definitely your kidney doctor. And, you know, it, it takes a little more time to go through, but I think it's helpful to understand why you're being prescribed a medication, like how it's, how it's helping you, what are the potential, you know, 
risks or downsides of it. And then you just, and does it interact with any, any medication or does it potentially impact your kidneys? And that's where your doctor can really explain that to you and evaluate because your, you know, diabetes doctor might not know that you, I mean, hopefully they do, but they might not know that you have kidney disease or it might not, you might be on the medication for a long time and now you have kidney disease and now it really needs to be addressed. And so I think it's just, again, knowledge is power and fully understanding why you're on your meds, how they're helping you. And then do they impact your kidneys or any other organs or parts of your body? That's excellent. All right. Now, Michelle, what about giving some concrete advice to our, our audience here about meals and snacks? So if you have diabetes and you have kidney disease, what would you give in terms of uh, specific examples on some snacks people could be eating? Yeah. So we, again, last episode, we talked more on the food side of, of diabetes and kidney disease, but I think overall, like starting with meals and we, again, what I had mentioned before was really emphasizing those non-starchy vegetables is important. And, you know, I think salads, stir fries, and even soups, especially now that we're getting into cold weather are really easy meals where you can pack in a lot of those non-starchy veggies. And again, it's not that you just eat the vegetables, but you bulk up the plate or the bowl with that. And so, um, and then with that, you, you add in ideally a plant protein source, maybe it's, you know, beans, lentils, legumes, maybe it's tofu. And, um, depending, let's say you're doing a, a bowl instead, you might use a higher fiber, um, grain, not a white grain. So that could be, You know, it might be something like brown rice, but again, brown rice isn't compared to white rice. It's more fiber, but it's not this really high fiber grain, something like farro or quinoa, which, you know, is a little bit higher in potassium. The quinoa is so careful if you do have a potassium restriction, but um, barley, like all of these millet, all these are different whole grains that can be used as well. So I think salads, bowls, stir fries um, and soups are really good because you can just kind of prep all your veggies in bulk and then you can, you know, repurpose them or use them or have leftovers is really good. And then, um, as far as snacks go, I usually tell people every time you eat, ask yourself where your fruit or your vegetable is. And so even snacks are a great place to get fruits and veggies in. And so even if you're that like chip and dip type of person, I want crackers with hummus. Well, can you slice up a cup of cucumbers or radish or some celery or carrots to have, you know, you have your one serving of crackers. So you're controlling, you know, the carbohydrate and, but you're also getting a serving of veggies then, or if you're looking at fruit for a snack, then Um, and you find that fruit maybe does raise your blood sugar a little more quickly, then that's where you can add something like a healthy fat or a plant protein to it to help slow down that digestion, give it a little bit more fiber. So you might do a quarter cup of walnuts with your strawberries, or maybe you do your apple with some natural peanut butter or nut butter, or again, the walnuts are good, the hummus or some sort of, you know, legume type of dip like that with your veggies and your crackers is or other good snack options. And, um, I mean, smoothies, sometimes people can make smoothies depending on their needs and potassium needs as well. They can make smoothies for snacks and you can always add vegetables into your smoothies and add, you know, seeds and stuff to get more fiber in. That way it's not just, and never use juice as your liquid in your smoothie. Um, Ideally, you can use something like water. You can use a um, a plant-based milk that doesn't have phosphorus additives in it. I've seen people, well, they'll do, they brew some green tea or something and they use that to make a smoothie. So I think those are all possible options, but the most important thing is that you are bulking it up heavy with the non-starchy veggies and non-starchy veggies that fit your specific potassium needs, whether it's low, medium, or high potassium. And then um, adding flavor, seasonings, homemade dressings, things like, you know, using vinegars are great too because they are, you know, not going to be high in sugar and they don't add a whole bunch of calories to it. So there's a lot of options, um, around that, but we want to always ask ourselves where, where are fruits and veggies? And then what are we pairing that with so that it's satisfying higher in fiber and ideally a whole minimally processed plant food. I love it. I love it. And, and by the way, I have a Vitamix and I love it because every morning I make my smoothie and it's Awesome. I mean, my, my wife convinced me that the Vitamix was awesome. And I was like stuck on the neutral bullet for the longest time and they would break and I'd get another one. Yeah. We got a Vitamix and it never breaks. And it, 
oh my God, it makes like the best stuff. I throw my berries in there, my strawberry in there. I got my ground flaxseed and all this kale in there. And I tell you, it comes out awesome. Yeah. And that's the, good, the beauty of berries in a smoothie is that it's going to be a purple or reddish purple smoothie. If you put like pineapple in it or something that you're going to have a green smoothie, which some people might be fine with, but some people might not like seeing it's not as um, visually appetizing if you are drinking a green smoothie as if a purple or a red smoothie. So berries help to mask that whatever vegetable. And I've seen, I mean, people put cauliflower, carrot, zucchini, cucumber, all into their smoothies as well. But I think the leafy greens are easier and you just kind of throw a handful in there and, and blend it all up. Well, that's awesome. So everyone, you know, we, we wanted to present two episodes for you guys for diabetes because we felt like this was such an important topic. And if you have more questions that we haven't addressed on this episode, bring them in. We will make sure that in the future episodes, we bring those in. So with that, Michelle, final thoughts on today's episode. I think final thoughts are that, um, you know, again, get your meds checked, make sure that you, you know, your all your doctors know what you're taking and even over at the counters, like you talked about the insects and even vitamins and supplements. I think from a food and nutrition standpoint, you know, again, veggies, 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 I say that all the time, um, but whole minimally processed plant foods. And again, start with you know, as far as meals and snacks go, start with one meal, whatever is the easiest meal for you to change or add more vegetables to start with adding beneficial things instead of just thinking about taking stuff away. And, you know, like you said, please send us our, your questions. Even if we do a whole nother episode on diabetes and kidney health, we are happy to do that. And I think, I mean, we have a pretty long, long list so far that we're going to be getting through, but we get through multiple questions every episode. And so Send, send them in plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com. That's right. Plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com. Remember, progress over perfection. And at the end of the day, wherever you are today is a great day to start making that change. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.